Hola, buenos dias. Welcome back to Clear Vision. My name's Simon and all the videos on this channel are based on my experiences as a psychotherapist. Today's video, I, I wanted to wrap up the uh, the series I did or the few, the few videos I did on um, narcissism, the unmasking narcissism videos. So I'm gonna finish with the uh, lighthearted uh, Greek tragedy of Narcissus to explain a few things. No doubt I'll end up coming back to the subject. It does seem to be one that resonates with a lot of people. But for now, Unmasking Narcissism, part four, and we're gonna look at the tale of Narcissus. Uh, as always, please like and subscribe. Um, and if there is anything that you specifically want to know about or have questions on, maybe I could do a video on, uh, please leave something in the comments below. So without further uh, to do, ado, there are um, several different versions of this story, depending on whose account, um, whose account, on whose version you read, but they all carry the same theme. But there are a few extra things in it, or a few extra characters and dynamics, which are often left out of telling the main story, but they are quite important. So, first of all, what we have to know is that Narcissus was a hunter, soldier, whatever it was that he was, but he was very, very handsome, aesthetically very pleasing to the eye. Whether he or not he was a god or not, it depends on which um, version you read. And he knew it. And there was a there was a there was a, pro a prophecy or, or a uh, it was some other god who said Narcissus will live a long, happy life as long as he doesn't come to know himself. So right there at the beginning, um, we are told. Um, really, it's it's almost like a summary of the entire thing. We are told that. A narcissist will live a very short life if they come to actually know themselves. Hence, all the behaviours that come wrapped up with having a relationship with a narcissist, dealing with a narcissist, having one in your midst. There is absolute, in terms of self-preservation, this is coming from the narcissist, they do not want to know themselves. And you're never going to get them to know themselves. So you're, you know, in short, you are completely wasting your time trying to change them. And as with all of my videos and the normal disclaimer, not everybody is a narcissist. Some people can have narcissistic tendencies on a, you know, a, a gradient scale. Uh, it doesn't make them a full blown narcissist. Please refer back to one of my videos about the development of a narcissist and the uh, combination of behaviors that you need, which will also be reflected in this tale. So Narcissus, and there was a there was a, a prophecy or or a, um, a telling that if Narcissus um, ever came to know himself, it would it would shorten his life dramatically. So, Nars but Narcissus was this beautiful hunter, you know, muscular, athletic, etc., etc. I'm sure he was very charming as well. And there, depending on the version, which version you read, there are various suitors, male, female, and they commit suicide to declare their love and show their love, one even um, impaling himself on a sword which Narcissus gifted him. And upon impaling himself on this sword and sacrificing himself, he also cursed Narcissus um, in one version. That said, there are, in, in this tale, as with a lot of Greek tales, there are rivers, forests, nymphs, and various other creatures, and also the god Zeus, the god of all gods, the couple to couple. Zeus liked to fornicate with the uh, river nymphs and um, would often mm, go down to the, the river in secret and um, go and have sex with all these river nymphs and orgies and drink wine and eat grapes and God knows what else he got up to. Hera, his wife, would become, used to become suspicious of his behaviour. And Hera would come down from Mount Olympus and, and you know, go into the forest and uh, uh, wander along the rivers trying to find Zeus and catch him in the act of infidelity. Um, Zeus, to counteract this, would send out a, a young nymph. I can't remember her original name, but she's known in this tale as Echo. So he'd send out Echo and she would head off Hera. She would find Hera and distract her by um, talking to her a lot, okay? Now, I'm, I'm gonna pull all this together and, and link it over to the other videos. But So she would talk to her a lot and distract her and distract her and distract her, and that would give Zeus and the nymphs enough time to get away, and then Hera would go back to Mount Olympus and Zeus would be there and she would accuse him and he'd say, nah, I don't know what you're talking about, etc., etc. 
Due to this, Hera, I believe it's Hera, then curses um, Echo, the river nymph. She punishes her by saying she can only, re the only words she can speak are that which have, she can only repeat that which is spoken to her. Hence the name Echo. Um, that's her punishment for protecting Zeus and the other river nymphs. And Echo, upon wandering the forest um, one day, comes across Narcissus. She, she, she spies him from a distance, from behind the undergrowth where she's hiding. And there's Narcissus wandering through, maybe on a hunt, whatever he's doing. And she follows him and falls in love with his beauty. But Echo knows she cannot, obviously she can't reveal herself. She, she knows she has this, um, you know, this curse on her with, with, to repeat that which is said to her. Um, so she can't really communicate anything to Narcissus, even if she was to reveal herself. So she stays hidden, but Narcissus ends up feeling intuition, somebody's there, and calls out for the person to reveal themselves, which Echo does. She eventually braves herself, comes forward, and tries to offer her love to him. And the only way she can do this is by physically trying to embrace him, by trying to hug him. He rejects her. Um, he is repulsed by her approach. He is repulsed by her offer of love or her, her de declaration of love, and he rejects her. Echo is heartbroken, as you can imagine, and the, the dynamics that occur between the two is obviously he expresses his distaste for Echo and her behavior, and she expresses it straight back. And then he becomes angry and says something else, and she says it straight back. So you get this kind of mirror effect. And the more he rejects her, the more she just reflects the rejection back. And there's nothing she can do about it because she's been cursed. They have this dynamic and eventually she's, she's you know, she's broken. Um, she cannot uh, function anymore and she goes off wandering into the forests, never really to be seen again. Um, she becomes a shadow of her former self. The tale then goes on to say that Nemesis is um, outraged by what has happened to Echo, both via Hera and via Narcissus. And she decides to exact punishment on Narcissus. And whichever way, whichever tale you read, Narcissus is lured by Nemesis or finds himself coming across uh, a, a river, a lake. And within that lake or river, he's, by, he's thirsty, he buys his reflection and as he's drinking, falls in love with his own reflection and is uh, stuck there permanently, admiring himself in the water. Or alternatively, he falls into the water, obviously, and drowns. Whatever happens, he dies at the side of the lake. The, the lake is also kind of personified in some way and is, you know, uh, uh, admires his beauty. But what is left in his place is the Narcissus flower. So what on earth is this about? How is it relevant? What's it all about? It's another way of looking at narcissistic dynamics. It's, it's a really rather interesting way and it's also there is a there is a lot to be learned and gained from mm, mythology um, and that's a whole separate subject. It's a very very interesting subject but these kind of archetypal tales of tragedy, comedy, human behavior, creationism, etc, etc. And within these we can find human dynamics and human um, conditions, pathologies, etc. And one of them the Greeks picked up on was narcissism. Um, which is, t and the tale of narcissism is told, the dynamics, it's all in there. And every character within this story is effectively part of those dynamics. So let's go right back to the beginning. Zeus is the ultimate kind of narcissist. What he he is absolutely omnipotent um, because he's a god, and not only is he a god, he's king of the gods. He is the god of the gods. He is the number one. He answers. He kind of answers really to nobody, and even he the wrath of Hera doesn't you know isn't really going to affect him too much. It can't because he's completely omnipotent, which ref is a reflection of the narcissist's attitude. They are godlike. They are at king of their world. They are gods of their world. There is nothing you can do 
to uh, make them accountable for their actions. By sending out Echo, Echo gives Hera, the wife of Zeus, who, who's suspicious of Zeus, and now you get this word, the word salad into play. So obviously Zeus goes back home and uh, Hera's there with lots of questions and suspicions. She is somebody in a relationship with a narcissist who has lots of suspicions as to what is going on, but doesn't have any solid evidence and is met by Zeus's own word salad. And equally, Echo is the mouthpiece of Zeus in that situation and heads off Hera, you know, it's metaphorical. He heads off Hera uh, by the side of the river to give everybody a time to get away. So Echo is exactly in this moment, in this aspect of the story, she is the, the embodiment of word salad along with Zeus. She is Zeus's mouthpiece for this part of the story. And Hera is the person dealing with a narcissist. When now, so, and so Hera's punishment is exacted on Echo because she's wrapped up with Zeus. She's connected to Zeus. She can't, Zeus is the problem, but Hera is trying to, wants, wants uh, Echo out of the way, wants, wants the word salad out of the way. That's how you have to understand it. Moving on from that, Echo has quite a role to play in this story and it's really interesting because she's often overlooked in the story. The, the stories, most people, if you say to them, do you know the story of Narcissus? And they go, yeah, yeah, it's the guy who looked in the lake, fell in love with his own reflection and died by the side. No mention of Zeus or Echo, Hera and all of these other dynamics or the flying monkeys, which is in another story, but it, that's another metaphor for sending out the, the harpies, sending out the harpies to get someone who's um, uh, trying to um, get the narcissist to know themselves. That's probably the best way to put it, actually. So I digress um, because as with all a lot of Greek mythology, there are, there's the main story and then there are branches of it, little little twigs and little clues going into other stories which connect it all together, which makes it actually really quite wonderful to study um, and read. Anyway, I digress. Um, where were we? Yes, so <laughs> Echo now reveals herself to Narcissus. Now, in this moment of the story, they're both embodying something. Narcissus is, of course, embodying, embodying the narcissist and Echo is embodying the person who is in love with the narcissist and trying to get them to accept that love. And this is where the depth really starts to kick in within the story. And it is a very, very short story. The interplay that happens, which, which creates the warning of you cannot love a narcissist into loving you back. That's exactly what they try to do to you. They will pretend, they will love bomb you, but it is an illusion and it's what it's, what they want you to do. They, they're showing you how they want you to behave. Theirs is uh, incongruent, it's not genuine. It's self-serving. Echo's was not self-serving. Echo was revealing herself, she was ready to spend the rest of her life with him as in all kind of romantic tales, love at first sight and all the rest of it. She wanted to save him, help him, be the one. She was going to be, uh, she wanted to, to be with him. And his rejections, of her love, which she then echoes back, become, it reflects, instead of reflect, mirror, become, um, are the metaphor, are the embodiment of the dynamics you will experience within a relationship with a narcissist. When you offer them kindness, when you offer them love, it will be rejected and it gets rejected unconsciously and also is vocalized often and they use abusive tactics. And that is because as I said in a previous video, they cannot let you in. It's impossible. They don't, they, inside them is this tiny, tiny vulnerable child which never got developed and this hard exterior shell is built up around them. It's a false sense of self. That's the one that's developed. It's delicate, brittle, but it is quite impenetrable. Um, it can be threatened and you can, if you, if you are able to penetrate through, you shatter the false self and what's left inside is the true self and the true self is the undeveloped child inside. It's all a very, very sad business, very tragic, as in one of my previous videos uh, where I went into the development of uh, the evolution of a narcissist, how they come about. 
But as I was saying, Echo, this interplay with Echo, and Echo is reflecting back his own kind of, it's a self-hatred, it's a self-loathing, which is being reflected back because the narcissist, and I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for narcissists, but the narcissist, it's a very, very complex, conflicted way to be. They're very, very complex, conflicted individuals very, very insecure, appear almighty and godlike, very, very secure in themselves, pushing everybody away, out of the way, abusive. But actually, it's because they are so, so vulnerable. And lastly, two things that then happen. Echo disappears off and becomes a shadow of her former self. She becomes a voice, a wisp on the wind. Uh, a, a whisper in the wind, sorry, or a wisp that uh, that wanders through the forests, and this is what will happen. This is a warning as to what will happen. This is symbolic of what will happen to you if you enter into a relationship with a narcissist, and you keep on trying, and you keep on trying, and you keep on trying, and you keep being rejected, and you keep being pushed back, and you keep being abused, and you keep coming forward, and you keep trying harder, and you keep trying to make it right, and you keep trying to love them, and you keep trying to get them to see exactly what it is they're doing. You keep trying to, remember the first bit of the tale, get them to know themselves. It's not gonna happen. All that happens is you become eroded away. You become a shadow of your former self, just like um, Echo. What happens to the narcissist in the end is that their own self-love becomes their downfall. Um, that is the metaphor. They will lead an empty life. It will seem possibly quite unfair from a distance. You know, there was, perhaps they're successful, perhaps they garner everything that they want and you covet that or whatever, but, inside but it, it's empty it's it's a, it's a shell it's an illusion to them because the, they never really experience love they're not going to let it in and they're never going to give love the only love they can give is to themselves it's that self-love and even that is kind of twisted and distorted hence the reflection thing the reflection in a lake what's the reflection going to be like it's going to be twisted and distorted and they're in love with that twisting and that distortion what's left at the end in the tale is the narcissus flower which is symbolic of the delicate inner child the delicate inner true self which never really fully reached its uh, potential its actualization it was never nurtured because of the false self that was built up around it in order to protect the child in the first place no, narcissists are not born narcissists are created so that's the tale. It is a tragedy. It is sad. There's lots of symbology in it. At the same time, it's just a tale. But it has all of the components in it. And when you when you start looking into narcissists and various other dynamics, it's all throughout Greek mythology. There is a lot of narcissism in Greek mythology, and it's always a downfall. Hubris is another one to look up. Hubris always brings around a downfall, this inflated sense of ego. There is always the downfall, it will always implode, it will always destroy the self. And if you are a practitioner of therapy or psychology, of whatever mode, you know, there's also a warning in there uh, with that not everybody can handle knowing themselves, not every client can handle knowing themselves. Not every person can handle having their eyes opened, I'll explain that one and perhaps like the Oedipus myth. Consciousness, conscious awareness, uh, knowing yourself is a gradual process of coming to be. Anything forced will smash things to bits. The same with nar narcissists. That's why if you force it, if you push it, you are just perceived as a threat and you will be annihilated back and rejected and kept away because the, the force of knowing oneself too quick, too soon is, is too much and it will, it will, it will disintegrate the, the, the psyche, if you like, the person. And okay, it's getting a little bit deep and a little bit whoa, but in essence, that's what it's all about. So I hope that helps. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, yeah, have a look into more Greek mythology and there are there is plenty of human psychology within Greek mythology. A lot of it's symbolic, a lot of it's metaphorical. Um, some other, no, I mean, if you are interested in the Greek mythology thing, other aspects of, uh, or other symbolic representations of the self and knowing the self too soon 
uh, can be found like with Medusa, uh, the story of Medusa, who, uh, she's an interesting one, and I'm going completely off topic, but she was um, uh, uh, punished for being raped. Um, something else, which, which is symbolic of, of society, society's attitude to that, and again, it's symbolic of Echo, who's punished for somebody else's misdemeanors of being made to, to, to do something. But when you face Medusa, you turn to stone. What are you faced with? You're faced with yourself. Yourself to know yourself too soon, too quick when you're not ready is uh, destructive. It turns you to stone. It makes you freeze. Um, or as in with the tale of Narcissus, you, you just stare into your own reflection and you die. I'm trying to think of some other examples. Uh, Oedipus, when he came to find out exactly who he was and what he was, gouged his own eyes out. It was too much for him to bear. So. So there are lots of warnings within that. And again, it, it, it's, it is mythology. It is just, I say just Greek mythology, but it is a, a human reflection on human dynamics and pathologies. If you're interested, there are lots of clues within all of that stuff. Until next week, please take care of yourselves. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it, it's just a slightly different way of looking at things. Another turn of the kaleidoscope, um, if you like. Okay, take care of yourselves. Adios.